message that's come out a couple of times about building, God building, building each other up, building up. Think about um, bodybuilders that are building in a, in a different way. Every meal is so important. Every meal has to have the nutrients and the protein to help them build and reach their goals. And I've just had this sense that every meal that we have and every time we open the Word and every time we, uh, we you know, go in our prayer closet and talk to the Lord, that the meals He is giving, there's so much richness, there's so, much, uh, there's so many nutrients, it's just such a vital time. He is speaking so clearly and so strongly. Um, it's just such a, yeah, it's such a wonderful time. And I'm excited about this meal this morning, and we're going to break into it, but let's, uh, let's pray first. Father, again, we approach your word, we approach this meal, we approach your table, we approach, um, you know, your, your voice and sitting at your feet like Mary and, and listening to what it is that you're saying to us. Father, may our heart be positioned to receive the seeds and receive the word of what you're speaking this morning, of what you're speaking in this season. May we be faithful stewards of the gardens of our heart. As we do our part and, and you do your part. The Bible says that Mary treasured these things in her heart. May we have the same hearts that treasure every word, every insight, every revelation, everything that it is that you're saying. May we treasure you in this season. May we see you as the true treasure, as the only real treasure. We treasure your word today, Father. Speak, speak clearly, speak through me, and, and just speak, speak to your people. I pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So needless to say, another one of the things I say many weeks is I'm excited about what God wants to say this morning. Um, I was going to go somewhere else this Sunday, and then on Monday, I just felt God speak this to me, and I'm so excited to share it. I want to start very quickly by just referencing Stephen again uh, and what we looked at in Acts 7. I didn't have too much time to really bring that together and prepare it, but it's, it's continuing to feed me. It's continuing to minister to me. And Stephen in Acts 7, we know he's being stoned. We know he's under intense persecution. I mean, that, that's to say the least. This is the persecution that would uh, eventually end his life. But, uh, you know, this is a season in which there's been mental and emotional strain. There's been persecution. Um, you know, it, it's, it's been difficult. It's been a trial. And yet what we see, what Stephen does, is he prays for the salvation of his persecutors. Do not hold this sin against them. And we talked about where Stephen's mind was. We talked about where, you know, he said, look, I see heaven open and I see, you know, Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And it's like this was his focus in a season of intense persecution. And it led him to pray as a first response. It led him to go to God as a first response and to pray for his persecutors he didn't lose focus on God's mission during persecution. You know, the Bible talks about, and I reference this a lot, the sons of Issachar that understood the times, but they knew what to do. There's, there's two levels. There's two things that are married that go together, and we don't want to be a people that simply understand the times or, you know, have insight to what's going on. We also need to know what to do. Stephen knew what to do. He knew how to approach the season, he knew how to approach the situation. When God says, I'll once again shake everything that can be shaken, you know, how many people know the end of the verse? I've, I've quoted it a lot lately, but the reality is, is we stop there and we say, wow, shaking, I'm not excited about that. You know, well, shaking, I don't want to go through shaking. Get, get me as far away from the shaking as possible. And yet the end of the verse is so incredibly important. It's the next level and the level in which we need to live that says, so that what is unshakable may remain. That's really good. That's, that's a really good place to be. And that's, that's where we want to live. That's, that's where we want to be, a people that are right there. We've got to look past the first level of our circumstances and use wisdom to see the opportunity that God is presenting. We need to live 
on that second level. Again, notice Stephen's approach. His focus is on heaven. Salvation is on his mind and his heart. And prayer is in his mouth. And God is calling us to take a higher perspective, to take heaven's perspective, the higher way of thinking and functioning that is concerned with God's agenda of salvation in this hour. You know, we don't want to miss these opportunities to bless and not curse, to promote unity and not division. In the Wednesday night prayer meeting, uh, uh, go back a bit. Tracy Roberts um, taught, yeah, you can hide Tracy, uh, taught at the, uh, people don't like when I point them out from the pulpit, <laughs> taught at the, uh, the women's meeting last week, and she talked uh, about storms and boats. She talked about the end of Acts when Paul was shipwrecked, and I thought, well, this is awesome because it's leading right into what I'm going to talk about. And then someone referenced Psalm uh, 23 in that same meeting, and and I chewed on that for a second, and we all know how it goes. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? What's after that? And? And? Yeah, he restores my soul. And if your soul is your mind, your will, and emotions, our mental tanks have been tested during this time, and our emotional tanks have been tested during this time. But the restoration for your soul is only found in one place, the shepherd. He restores my soul. You know, it's really important that we extend extra grace during this time, uh, even in the church because there are interactions that happen uh, in community everywhere at the moment where there's an exposing of people's mental strength and emotional strength. There's an exposing of, of where people are. There's such an emotional, emotionally charged culture at the moment. It, ex, extra grace. Anybody ever like an extra helping of something? eat something really good, I'd like some more of that. Yeah, extra grace. So let's order from God's menu and from community some extra grace in this season. Ecclesiastes, I sent this around to you. A pastor friend of mine shared it on Facebook. I saw it, so I, I sent it out to the church. I'm going to read it again. Ecclesiastes 7, 21 to 22 says, also, do not take to heart everything people say, except the pastor. Oh, I didn't have my glasses on. Sorry. Do not take to heart everything people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. For many times also your heart has known that even you have cursed others. I've got to tell you, you know, the, the fight for unity is worthwhile because the living stones as a house are going to do much more than the living stone on its own. God's purposes in this hour will be fulfilled through unity. It's so important that Jesus' last prayer before he goes to the cross, he says, I pray that they would be one even as I and the Father and one. Unity is worth fighting for. It's worth guarding. And let me say this about Psalm 23, that he restores my soul. That restoration for your soul is not found in the end of the pandemic. It's all up there. I, I broke all the rules of PowerPoint. I put too many words up there and the font's too small. I apologize. It was, it was late last night. <laughs> Restoration for your soul will not be found in the end of the pandemic. The removal of the storm is not your salvation, right? Many think that our inner lives are going to go back to normal after the pandemic, but the truth is that your inner life will only be healthy when the Good Shepherd is restoring your soul when you're feeding from the pastures that he brings you to and the quiet waters he leads you beside. I don't want life to go back to normal. I want it to go back to Jesus. 
this is a great time to hit the reset button on your life, to not just mosey along like maybe we were before, but to take the shaking that's happened and to come back to the Good Shepherd. God is teaching us in this time what it means for Him to be our shepherd. He is teaching us how to receive the nourishment that He leads us to that only comes from Him. And there's a reality that, you know, whatever source you've been feeding from or drinking from is being exposed for what it is in this time. It doesn't have the nourishment that you need that the Good Shepherd provides to be able to make it through this sort of season. So, okay, let's get into this. I told you I was going to talk about boats. Um, I've done a couple of sermons on paralleling uh, two boat stories, and I want to do it again. Yeah, row, row, row your boat. Yes, this is not the boat you want to row, though. Um, you'll find out in a bit, but that's okay. Uh, I, I love these two stories, and you know, when you think you've pulled everything out of, uh, out of a story, God goes ahead and shows you something else in it, and it's just so good, in, in my humble opinion. Um, he is so wonderful. He is so excellent. He is so faithful. He has been so good to, you know, on a personal level, just lead me through this time. And, you know, as I've positioned my heart before him just to, to, to feed me and, and continue to bless me. And I hope that is true uh, for you as well through this time. You know, the emotional and mental strain, just know we're praying for you. We love you. We're here. Candace and I are working on this poster document right now called How to Connect. And it's like it's nothing, you know, groundbreaking, but it's a list of the many, many ways that you can connect in community here, that you can connect with us. And, and just know, again, we are a body. We're lifting each other up, encouraging each other daily, as the Bible says. Okay. Uh, from the story of Peter walks on the water, Matthew 14. You can go there if you want. I'm not going to read it because we all know it. And if you don't, it's in this book right here. Matthew chapter 14, Peter walks on the water, Jesus walks on the water. Uh, many, many pastors have preached from this, this passage. Uh, you, you notice the elements in it. There's people involved. Disciples are there. Peter, obviously, is one of the stars in this show. Uh, Jesus is definitely a star in this show, walking on water. The other thing we often note is the storm. But there's a third element that I, I want to look at, and that's the, the role of the boat. Okay, so, so follow me for a second, right? Man is, is walking the earth, and he comes to a body of water. He's, he's never been in water before. Gets in the water and, and realizes, you know, hey, I, I sink if I don't intentionally float or swim. Okay, so... He realizes if I want to cross this big body of water, I'm not going to make it. I need to build something to survive. I need to build something to help me get across the water and to survive my circumstances. The boat, as I'm going to be talking about it today, is the man-made attempts to survive, to pull life from strategies and things of man. The boat represents represents man's attempts to survive. The boat represents what we've placed our faith in, the things that we've placed our faith in to live and to survive. Obviously different than what God uh, provides for us. I'll use the word salvation or life interchangeably, and I'm not speaking of heaven uh, one day down the road. I'm speaking of the quality right now of our mental and emotional lives. So when I use the word salvation, I'm talking about our health and our, our, our well-being right now because salvation, sozo, the Greek word sozo, pertains to your whole life. And the kingdom of heaven is within us. The kingdom of heaven is now. These are all Bible verses. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, your inner life right now now. Okay, subconsciously, there may be things in your subconscious that you're trusting in without even knowing it. 
the things that we've placed our faith in in this world that are being shaken at the moment, bank accounts, possessions, relationships, organizations. Uh, you know, many, there's, there's communities in the city and organizations for relationship. We can build relationships. There are many things that we trust in and put our faith in. But here's, here's the message, right? The disciples are out on the water. It's scary. There's a storm. They don't know what's going to happen. Jesus comes walking to them, and there's a lot that is communicated right there, Jesus walking on the storm. He could have floated in without even touching the water. He could have rowed in on another boat. He could have come in a speedboat. Check out my boat. Why are you guys rowing? But he didn't. He came walking on the water because he needed to convey the message that you can live above your storm. That you can live in such a way that the effects of the storm, the impact of the storm, don't have to affect you. And he didn't just want to model it, he wanted them to experience it. So he calls Peter out of the boat. So Jesus' display of walking on water was conveying to the disciples that they didn't need to trust in their man-made ideas to survive. Jesus was seeking a transfer of faith. Only Peter steps out of the boat and trusts Jesus to care for him during a life storm. Many of the disciples stayed in the boat. There's this really interesting dynamic that even though they could see Jesus, even though that they saw their friend step into this different area, place his faith in Jesus instead of the boat, transfer his faith from the man-made object into Jesus' way of living and walking on the storm, it doesn't say that any of them got out of the boat as well. It just says that Peter was the only one that got out of the boat, right? Walking on water, hearing God's call to come, many still trust in the boat for salvation or the restoring of their souls and never walk on the water. So when Peter's on the water, this is, this is incredible. He didn't experience the waves tossing him back and forth. However, the disciples that stayed in the man-made object continued to experience the effects of the storm. They continued to rock in the boat, and they continued to feel every wave and, and the wind that was blowing hit them, and yet Peter steps out, and all of a sudden the storm has no effect. He steps out into where Jesus is calling him to have faith in him and in Jesus and doesn't feel the effects of the storm. Some believers are trying to weather the storm by staying in the boat, and of course, the boat representing our man-made structures and strategies to live is constantly impacted by the storms of life. And as long as we continue to trust in anything other than God, we will continue to experience the effects of the storm, the fear, the anxiety, the stress, the worry. In fact, the presence of these emotions is a telltale sign that your faith isn't holy in Jesus. That's not a condemning thing. It's an encouragement to step out of the boat, to transfer your faith to where your faith will be unshakable, to transfer your faith onto the person that is unshakable, that isn't impacted by the storm at all. What is your first reaction when a trial comes? Is it worry or is it faith? This will tell you what your faith is placed in. So 1 Corinthians 2.5, I, I read this verse when I was a teenager. Uh, on my front porch at my house in Napanee on Camden Road. I remember reading this verse and I highlighted it immediately and it seemed to stuck with me these 25 years or so, <laughs> these, these 20 plus years. And I love this, 1 Corinthians 2.5 says this, so that your faith may not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Do you know that your faith can rest on stuff? You know, a lot of us, we, we're concerned about having faith to begin with. You know, just want to have some faith. But do you know that there's another level about what your faith is actually resting on? And it talks about not resting on men's wisdom, not resting on the boat, not resting in what it is that you have structured to help you survive this time. 
so that your faith may not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. It's not just the faith of what you're stepping into, but it's also recognizing and releasing what your faith has been in. We all have faith, but what does your faith rest on? Does it rest on Jesus, or does it rest in the boat to continue to carry you through the season of the storm? Many pastors have talked about Peter and his, his focus and how he sank when he took his eyes off Jesus. And, you know, that, that probably can't be said enough. It's still true today from the first person that ever preached it. When Peter's focus was on the storm, he actually felt fear and insecurity. Spending too much time looking at the storm can breed these emotions of fear and insecurity. But as soon as you look at Jesus you float. I want to be a floater. <laughs> Peter sank when he took his eyes off Jesus. He started drowning in the storm's elements. When you focus on the storm, you feel the effects of the storm, but when you look at Jesus, you feel the effects of heaven, love, peace, joy, all the goodness of who God is. All right. As we wind down here, let's take a quick look at the second story, and this is the most exciting part for me. I, I really enjoyed this, and I know you're going to love it. I know you're all smiling under your mask, too. Jesus calms the storm. So Mark 4, this one's in Mark 4, probably a couple other parallels in the other Gospels, but uh, Jesus calms the storm. We all know the story. Disciples are in a boat. Storm whips up. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. Awesome. Disciples come and say, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care if we drown? The strength of the storm was so strong that the disciples lost faith in the boat to save them. There has to be a storm so strong in our life that we start to doubt in what our faith is in, if it's in something shakable, if it's not in Jesus. There needs to be a storm that comes along that is so strong that it exposes the weakness of what we have our faith placed in. I'm glad you're so excited about that. God was able to use a storm so strong to expose their faith in the man-made object, the boat, to keep them safe. Don't you care if we drown? This boat is not going to save me in this storm. I need help from another source. A storm had to be strong enough that the boat could be seen for what it is, not able to save. God had to use a storm to reveal what our faith was in and show that it didn't have the power to save us. That's exciting. That's what's happening in this season. We are, it's being revealed what our faith is resting on and, and what our faith is in. And that's a really, a really good thing because Jesus is still... Uh, inviting us to come. He's still inviting us to step out of the boat. He's still inviting us to place our faith in Him. He's still inviting us to a place in which the effects of the storm won't be felt anymore. How many people would like that? Yeah, I'd like the effects of the storm to stop. Well, you know where it's going to happen? It's going to happen standing beside Jesus, walking on top of the water. The storm continues until our faith is no longer in the boat. <laughs> we, we don't want this storm to continue, do we? But there's a purpose for this storm. We don't have to feel the effects of this storm because we can step out of the boat and stand where Jesus is on top of the storm. However, the storm rages on because there are others that are still discovering what they've placed their faith in. Peter gets out and doesn't feel the effects of the storm anymore. But you know what? There's a whole boat of people over here that are still being tossed back and forth. What can Peter do? Hey, come stand with me and Jesus. Look, look, look what it's like here, standing with faith in Jesus. Come stand with us. Step, step out of the effects of the storm. Step out of, of the, the wind and the waves that are tossing you back and forth. Look, we continue to experience the effects of the storm until we step out of the boat, stand with Jesus. 
And only when it was obvious that the boat wasn't going to save us did the disciples experience Jesus as Savior. They came to the conclusion, wow, this isn't going to do it. We're going to die if something doesn't happen. And Jesus stands up and says, peace be still. And he's seen for who he is. You know, I believe God wants us to find peace while the storm still rages. Again, it's not in the end of the pandemic. It's not in the end of the storm. There is peace within the storm. There is peace standing beside Jesus on the storm. We need to keep in mind that there are other people still in the boat that God is still trying to reach. There are other people in the boat that are still feeling the effects of the storm, and it has purpose. It has meaning because Jesus is calling them to come as well. The best thing that Peter can do, the best thing that each of us can do, is to step out of the boat, stand with Jesus, and then call others that are in the boat to come with us. It's a proven test that we found peace when our inner life is calm while the storm rages around us. God is calling us to focus on him, to stop giving all of our attention to the man-made objects, and to stand on top of the storm. And just like I've explained with Peter, we've got to keep our focus on the mission, like Stephen did, to make disciples. We, We ourselves want to get out of the boat, stand with Jesus, restore our souls, mental and emotional health, let him restore our soul, but then we can't forget about the others in the boat. We got to turn around and encourage people to come with us. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning?